Hey everybody, it's the 3D Printing Professor, and if you're new to 3D printing, you might be wondering, what is the deal with MakerBot, right? Hey everybody, welcome back. So, MakerBot is a name in 3D printing that's kind of known for both good and ill, and you might be wondering why. What happened that people seem to both love and hate MakerBot at the same time and with same amounts of vitriol and heartfelt joy? Well, the answer is it's really a question of history, and it's a history that I was there for and a part of. Now, this isn't going to be any sort of, of well-researched, analytical look at the economics. No, this is just a story of one guy and his relationship with a company as it grew and changed and as things happened. So I hope that you'll find it entertaining. I was there. My first 3D printer is a MakerBot. My first blog about 3D printing that kind of kick-started this whole thing was called Joe's MakerBot. I was excited to have my name associated with them. And yet now, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We need to go back and talk a little bit of history. Go back to the beginning and talk about where 3D printing came from. And 3D printing started with this man right here, Chuck Hull, the inventor, the father of 3D printing. He created this beautiful machine in the 80s that used stereolithography, a term that he coined, and STL files, which I think he might have even invented, to create 3D models. Now, this is not a stereolithography 3D printer. The 3D printers that got us all excited were created originally by this guy, S. Scott Crump. He created the FDM printing process, the idea of squirting out plastic and building something layer by layer, melting that plastic together. Uh, S. Scott Crump founded Stratasys. Scott Hull, or Chuck Hull, founded 3D Systems, and for 20, 30 years, these guys dominated 3D printing. They were the only 3D printers in town, mostly because they held the patents for 3D printing and nobody could touch them. But then those patents expired and Adrian Bauer, a British professor, started a project to create a machine that would use this idea of 3D printing to make parts that could be used to make another 3D printer. It was called the RepRap Project, and it was inspiring. The idea that for a couple hundred dollars and a handful of parts that were made on another 3D printer, you could have a 3D printer. Now, when I heard about the RepRap Project, I was immediately inspired, but I couldn't quite join in at that time. Uh, 3D printing, even though a couple hundred dollars is way less than the tens of thousands that they were, was still a bit much for a, a young and struggling father of, of a young family, but it inspired other people as well. It inspired these guys. Adam Mayer, uh, a RepRap Project alumni, Zach Smith, and this last guy, this ex-teacher artist slash puppeteer, Brie Pettis. Ah, Brie Pettis, the charismatic face of MakerBot, the man who we watched in interviews taking down other companies, showing them that open source was really the way to go and the power of, of sharing with the community and sharing with other people. We, we all got behind Brie as he talked about just the absolute brilliance and ways that this technology was going to change the future. He was the voice and we were him. It was, it was this amazing synergy. He was the David that was going to slay the Goliath in 3D printing. But the problem with the David and Goliath story is if you follow it through to the end, it doesn't end too well for David. And we kind of get a little bit of that in this story. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're not there yet. Right now, we are here with the Thingomatic, a kit with all the parts that you need. No self-sourcing, just a thousand dollars or so, and you could have a 3D printer. It wasn't perfect, but hey, where it wasn't perfect, it was open sourced and you could fix it. Well, maybe not you, but somebody could and somebody did. As a community, we would take the things that MakerBot made, fix them, send them back to MakerBot, and they would get incorporated into the next generation of 3D printers. The Replicator 1, oh, all sorts of problems, but the Replicator 2, 
much better, fixed with designs created by the community. Around this time, MakerBot created Thingiverse, a place that we could share our files back and forth, and whole communities sprung up around that. People sharing amazing designs and then taking those designs, tweaking them, making them their own, adjusting the design so that they work better and putting them back on Thingiverse for somebody else to do. There are things on Thingiverse that are remixes of remixes of remixes of recombines of other things and it is fantastic and it was a great, and it still is, a great community to be a part of, especially in those early days. I myself get to claim having parts on, on Thingiverse with only four digit numbers, I think, maybe five. Anyways, I, w I was one of the early people on Thingiverse and it was super exciting to be a part of Thingiverse back in those days. Was everything that MakerBot did perfect? No. They created this, the idea of a, of a treadmill that you could print a part on and it would pop it off and print another one and it had a lot of problems. But you know what? It's okay because we as the community, we could help them work it out and make it better. And then things started to change. MakerBot got to be notable and people started noticing them. Investors started noticing them and investors wanted them to grow and so they would place money and, and help them grow. And of course MakerBot said yes to that. And, and of course they decided to, to grow and, and open a new store and, and try to increase their presence. But at the same time, investors want security. They want to know that no, no company in China is going to just take those open source designs that you put out there, make the same exact thing that you're making cheaper and ship it back to America and sell it for less. So the next thing that happened, well, they had to go closed source and the terms of service of Thingiverse had to make a change. Now, mind you that those changes to the terms of service, if you really look closely at them, weren't any big deal, but the fact that they changed means that people had to look at them. And when they looked at them, they realized, hey, this says that MakerBot and Thingiverse can do anything they want with our models. And droves of people left Thingiverse. This Occupy Thingiverse movement started, and there are still things on Thingiverse that our placeholders left from when people left that they just took their stuff off, replaced all the files with Occupy Thingiverse files, and then changed the descriptions. Now, Again, is this a bad thing? No, uh, it just, they need to be able to do anything they want with your files. If they want to do things like host them on an online website and share them with others. But people looked at that and said, yeah, but that means that they could use them to sell their printers and they could use them to market their stuff. And it's true, it does give them that ability, but generally speaking, MakerBot's never done that. They've been the good guy in most of these cases, at least pertaining to other people's models. They don't explicitly go out there and share your models with the world and claim that it's theirs. They do generally give credit when they do share models. Now, again though, it's questionable. It's, it's, it's not bad. The individual steps aren't bad and this step wasn't bad but it caused some people to bail out and leave Thingiverse and, and turn their back on MakerBot. And when the Rep 2 came out and it was all closed source, well, boy, people hated that. Going closed source from going open source. In fact, at this point, some of the original creators of MakerBot, Zach Smith, Adam Mayer, they abandoned as well because they didn't agree with what the direction that MakerBot was taking. Going closed source was against everything that MakerBot had been for in the past. But again, it's a defensible move. I mean, the investors wanted some security over their investment. So of course you're going to go closed source. You can't run a business with an open source company. At least the common knowledge says that. And when common knowledge is paying the bills, you got to follow through with what they say. Now, the Rep 2 was a step above the Rep 1. And the truth is, we could still help them fix the problems that came out with it. But when the Gen 5 machines came out, and at the time I couldn't even find a whole picture of a Gen 5 machine. This is just our cool user interface. The Gen 5 machines had a new motherboard that we knew nothing about, a new way to interface that motherboard, a new way that it interfaced with the new hardware that we again knew nothing about. So unless we were willing to tear everything down and experiment with things with a, with a sniffer, there was no way we could figure out how to help them. 
And at this point, there are smart first generation smart extruders, just like all the first uh, generation machines that, that MakerBot came out with had some huge problems. But this time, this time the community wasn't there to help them. By this time, the people who had helped them in the past were even starting to regret helping them. And so why should we even tear down and try and fix this thing? You know what? You want to go it on your own? You want to close your source? Then fine. You fix this problem. And people left MakerBot again in droves. And the fact that this didn't work was really frustrating to MakerBot. They had to fix it. They had to, to go through it. It was a PR nightmare for them. And then this showed up. A patent. A patent for that conveyor belt uh, build plate that I looked at or that I showed you before. Now that's that's not too bad. It's just a patent and it's for something that MakerBot made. But then when this patent showed up, oh, the upset that that caused. What we're looking at here, you might not recognize it, but it's the part that presses the filament into the drive gear that pulls it down. And this was a part invented by the community. Now, before you get all panicked, just like people did at the time, looking at the patent, they aren't patenting that arm that was invented by the community. They were patenting some small changes to that arm that they made. The arm itself, they recognized, was not patentable because it was created from a uh, community-created uh, model. But seeing this, seeing something that the community started and that MakerBot patented, really frustrated people and even if in the end it turned out defensible the fact that they were patenting something that was started by the community was bad now this is the part where i started to leave makerbot and i closed down my joe's 3d uh my joe's makerbot blog and opened up joe's 3d workbench and started youtubing and things like that but makerbot had a bad opinion now what bothered me about this was not so much that MakerBot was patenting a design created by the community. They weren't, and, and I knew that. What bothered me was that they were patenting it all. This was a company that could claim that it came into business only because patents expired, and now they're jumping in and playing the patent game? Yeah, it's defensible, I guess. I mean, you got to defend what you have and when the when the money's coming in and saying that you need to do it you need to play the patent game but i don't know that just didn't feel right to me and this guy this bearded terrorist wannabe right here he kind of lost a pin, the good opinion of a lot of people and eventually makerbot got bought out by stratasys and stratasys put this jerk out to pasture and good riddance to him. Then this woman stepped up as the new CEO of MakerBot, Jenny Lawton, and things looked, well, it didn't look good for Jenny. She disappeared a little while later, and then Jonathan here took over, and Jonathan recently decided that he needed to go pursue other opportunities, and now it's all in the hands of this man, Nadev Goshen. Meanwhile, we're just watching MakerBot's numbers drop and just thrilling with every drop you know what they are making every single bad decision we're gonna point them out news feed after news feed was decrying the death of makerbot and pointing out the problems that they were having say a really classy hack a day that's that's good that's nice you know the thing is if this is all starting to sound like a high school homeroom drama to you i agree let me let me spell it out for you MakerBot is the handsome, significant other next door who was way above what we could possibly hope for, but somehow caught our eye, and the Maker community was the, the blushing, demure uh, protagonist of this story. And when MakerBot went out with that... S well, I can't say that on this channel. When MakerBot went out with the popular blonde girl to prom and left us alone... Well, you know what, let's just watch him fall to the bottom. But the truth of the matter is, this isn't helping anybody. Yes, it's, it's, it's sad that MakerBot was once making machines for the Maker community, and now they don't seem to be doing that anymore. They've gone after a different audience, but the truth is, they're still trying to make 3D printing work and make it happen. And that's a hard thing to do. They've got an uphill battle ahead of them. And while they might not 
be succeeding the way that we thought that they were. They never were succeeding on the level that they're trying to. Hating on them, disliking them, and, and, and saying bad things about them every chance that we get isn't helping anybody. It's only hurting us. You know what? Nadav, I wish you well, and I hope that you manage to pull something off. You guys still have Thingiverse. It's a great site, and I hope that you leverage it to do good things for the community and for 3D printing. And I honestly hope that you get your 3D printers in line and that you make this work because the truth is we need more 3D printers. We need better 3D printers. These things work, but their interface, come on, you guys are doing great in helping that interface go. Just, in my opinion, get the price down, but otherwise you guys have a chance. And, and I really hope that you guys can make something happen. So good luck to you. Let's remember everybody, we all got into this because, well, because we're nerds and outcasts and, and in other places of the world we didn't quite fit in, but here, here we can all fit in. So let's let everybody fit in. 3D printing should be inclusive, even of the people who hurt us in the past. Let's, let's get over the hurt. Let's be the bigger person and let's wish everybody everybody in 3d printing whether whether we would agree with them otherwise whether they're the sort of person that we would hang out with whether they look like we would expect them to look let's just remember to include everybody in 3d printing that's that's my plea and that's what i hope that we'll be able to do as always i thank you very much for watching safety first and i'll see you next time Thank you.